Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the like button's eye drops with acid. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Alan Burkhart opened a riverfront restaurant in Beaumont, Texas, and for the next 50 plus years, his customers would eat burgers, drink beers, and on super hot days, they would jump off the pier into the river to cool down. But one day in June of 2015, while Alan was in his restaurant looking out the back window, he saw something strange in the river. When he went outside to get a better look, he noticed his customers who were eating outside had also noticed this strange thing, and now they were standing up and nervously watching it as it floated by. Alan immediately yelled out to everyone to not go swimming, obviously, based on what they were seeing, and then he went back inside and made a sign that said no swimming, and he posted it on the pier. A few weeks later, on July 2nd, a 28-year-old local man named Tommy Woodward and his girlfriend, Victoria LeBlanc, arrived at Alan's restaurant for a fun night out. After several hours of drinking and playing pool, Tommy and his girlfriend made their way over to the bar and had a seat, at which point Tommy began telling his girlfriend that he planned on going swimming swimming in the river that night. The bartender overheard him and said, Tommy, you can't go swimming in the river anymore. But Tommy was a bit of a rule breaker and said he didn't care. He was going to go anyways. The bartender began pleading with him and even got other staff members of the restaurant to talk sense into Tommy that he should not get in the water. But eventually Tommy just stood up. He grabbed his girlfriend's hand, left the restaurant and began walking down towards the pier. The bartender at this point just kind of rolled her eyes and thought, I can't do anything to stop him. And so she went back to her bartender duties. When Tommy and Victoria got down to the pier, the black water was quiet and calm as Tommy took off his shirt and removed his valuables from his pockets. Right before Tommy was about to jump into the water, Victoria stopped him and said she thought she saw something moving underneath the pier. But Tommy just laughed and said he didn't care and jumped into the water and disappeared below the surface. Immediately, the water around Tommy seemed to erupt like a bomb had gone up underneath him. When Tommy came back up to the surface, he was screaming and trying to swim back to the pier, but before before he could get there, something pulled him under the water. And then a few seconds later, Tommy came back up again, and this time Victoria could see the left side of his torso was bleeding profusely. And so she instinctively leapt into the water to try to save him. And Tommy, even though he knew he needed help, he said to her, get back on land, save yourself. And so she obliged. She climbed back onto the pier, and when she turned around, she caught a final glimpse of Tommy as he was pulled back under the water, and this time he did not come back up again. The bartender had heard screaming and so ran down with a flashlight to the pier and when she got there Victoria was hysterical and she was yelling Tommy's name and looking out over the water and so the bartender at this point is reasonably certain she knows what happened to Tommy but if by some miracle he's still alive she wants to find him and so she raises her flashlight and she begins scanning the now totally calm black water and as she's scanning she finds him he's floating face down way off in the middle of the river and as soon as the flashlight hits him something pulls his body under the water and he disappears from view. It was no secret that the river that ran next to Alan's restaurant was home to alligators. But these alligators were small and they didn't bother anybody and so the locals really didn't have any issues swimming with them. In fact, they had nicknamed two of the alligators that were seen the most often. They named them Cheeto and Marshmallow. But on that day in June of 2015, when Alan and the other guests saw this thing out in the river, what they were seeing was a monster alligator, the likes of which they had never seen before in this river. It was at least 11 feet long and over 400 pounds, and that summer, it decided to make the underside of Alan's pier its home. And so that night, when Tommy leapt into the water, it was this monster alligator's feeding time, and so Tommy became its dinner. About two hours after Tommy was attacked, what was left of him was recovered from the river. Tommy became the first alligator-related fatality in Texas in nearly 200 years. 
Just north of San Francisco, California, lies Lake Berryessa, which is a massive freshwater reserve that provides drinking water and hydroelectricity to hundreds of thousands of people. The lake is not a natural occurrence. A dam was built in the area in the 1950s, and after it was in place, the water that pooled above it became Lake Berryessa. During the dam's construction, the engineers realized the structure would not be enough to keep all the water in if the lake were to flood. To solve this problem, the engineers installed what's called a spillway in the middle of the lake. A spillway is like a huge drain. When the water levels in the lake are normal, none of the water will go into this drain. But when water levels reach a certain point, the water, instead of spilling over the side of the dam, will spill into this spillway, and it will travel 200 feet straight down the 78-foot wide pipe. And when it reaches the bottom, the pipe bends sharply to the right, and the water is shot out on the other side of the dam into a creek. On a summer day in 1997, 41-year-old graduate student Emily Schwelich was swimming in the recreational side of Lake Berryessa. That evening, before she got out of the water, she decided she wanted to have a closer look at the spillway, which at the time, because the water levels had risen high enough, water was pouring down into the spillway. So Emily turned around and began casually swimming away from the recreational area towards the center of the lake. At some point, she would have seen signs poking out of the water, and she would have seen them on land, telling her to stay back. After passing those signs, she would have reached a long line of red caution buoys that were the last line of defense to try to keep people back from the spillway. But Emily went under those buoys and continued on towards this huge drain. Meanwhile, the other swimmers that had seen Emily take off towards the middle of the lake, they didn't think she would actually get close to the spillway. Nobody went close to the spillway, and so nobody tried to stop her. Around 6.10 p.m., Emily made it to right before the edge of the spillway. It would have been deafeningly loud as 360,000 gallons of water poured over the edge into the spillway every second. Emily most likely was trying to get right up to the edge and then grab that outer cement lip and kind of anchor herself and then lean over the edge and get a look down into the hole. But what ended up happening is as she got closer and closer to the edge, the current picked up so dramatically that it began pulling her down into the hole. And so by the time she's over the cement lip, she had already turned around, realizing her mistake, and was trying desperately to swim away from the spillway. But it was too late. Her legs got whipped around and sucked down into the spillway, and she managed to grab onto the lip, the outer lip of the spillway, with her legs now in the spillway. Thousands and thousands of gallons of water are pouring down on her face, and so she can't pull herself back up. So she's pinned inside the spillway. People on land notice this happening to her, but they realized there was nothing they could do to help her. If they tried to go down there and pull her out, they would get sucked in too. And so they called the authorities who have the right equipment to pull her out. But by the time they got out there, it was too late. Emily had managed to hang on to that edge for 20 minutes. But finally, the water overpowered her. She lost her grip and she fell backwards down the 200 foot chute to her death. On August 6, 2018, a manager at a grocery store in Lancaster, California, which is a town about an hour north of Los Angeles, started getting complaints from his staff and from customers about a terrible smell coming from the front of the building. The manager, who had come in the back door that day and so hadn't smelled anything, began walking through the store towards the front in order to investigate. He only made it to the cash registers before he had to throw his arm over his mouth and his nose because the whole front half of the store reeked. The manager's first thought was that food must have somehow fallen somewhere out of view and it was rotting and that was causing the smell. But when he went past the cash registers and went out the front doors, the smell got exponentially worse and he noticed the smell was predominantly coming from this brown liquid on the ground that seemed to be leaking out of the base of one of the pillars that lined the front of the store. And so the manager thought, well, it can't be food that's causing the smell. It's got to be a sewer pipe leak that's happened right underneath this pillar and it's seeping up through the cement and that's what's causing the smell. And so the manager went back inside the store and he called a plumber and then a couple of hours later the plumber showed up the manager pointed at the brown liquid out on the front and explained what he thought was going on and the plumber looked at it and then looked at the manager and said there's no sewer pipe underneath here so whatever that liquid is it's coming from inside the pillar and so the manager was stumped because this pillar and all the others in the front of the store were purely decorative there's no reason anything would be leaking out from inside of them there was nothing inside of them and so the manager asked the plumber
hammer to pull off one of the bricks around the area where this liquid was coming from so they could see what was on the other side. And so the plumber got his crowbar and he began prying off one of the bricks. And then once it was loose enough, he pulled the brick away, revealing an opening into the pillar. And the two men got down and they looked inside and what they saw horrified them. And they immediately backed up and they called the police. Five days earlier, a 35-year-old man named Ray Rivera was pulled over by Lancaster, California police on suspicion of driving a stolen vehicle. As soon as the officer got out of their cruiser and began approaching Ray's vehicle, Ray peeled off down the road, turned the corner, and was gone. The officer immediately got back in their cruiser and took off after Ray, but he had gotten a huge jump start and he had fled into a highly populated and busy area where it would be relatively easy to blend in and disappear. The officer called for backup and before long there were dozens of other cop cars in the area looking for Ray, but no one could find him. A little while later, the police heard over the radio that a car matching the description of the one Ray had been driving had just crashed into a local grocery store. And so the police head over to the grocery store and sure enough, there's Ray's white pickup truck crashed into the side of the building, but Ray is nowhere to be found. The police began asking witnesses at the store if they had seen the man driving the white pickup truck, and a few said they had. They said after he crashed, he leapt out of the vehicle and he ran inside the grocery store and then went up a flight of stairs to the staff-only area. The police went inside the grocery store and searched the staff-only area, and they searched the rest of the grocery store, but he wasn't there. And so they assumed at some point after going inside, he managed to slip back out again and had escaped on foot. And so the police, just as a precaution, stayed outside of this grocery store for several more hours in case if Ray was in there, they would catch him trying to leave. But after a couple of hours, he never did. And so they put out a warrant for his arrest and they left. Well, it would turn out Ray had run inside the grocery store, but he had never left. After running up to that staff only area, he found a crawl space and he hid inside of it for several hours until the police left. And then at some point that evening, he decided he wanted to find a better hiding spot. And so he made his way onto the roof. Now, it's not entirely clear how he did that. Either the crawl space he was in directly connected to the roof, or he got out of the crawl space and then found his way onto the roof another way. But regardless, he found his way onto the roof. And when he got up there, he realized the roof was totally flat until you got to the very front edge of the building, the part that looked down into the parking lot. There on the roof was this small structure that was built up just on the front end of the roof that gave the impression from the parking lot looking up that this building was a lot bigger than it really was. On the back side of this phony structure was a door that was accessible from the roof. Ray saw this access door and ran over to it. He tried the handle and it was unlocked. So he opened it up and he went inside. Now, this attic-like space that sat on the front of the building really didn't have that much of a purpose to it. However, it did provide access to the insides of all of the pillars that lined the front of the store. And so it's believed that Ray, as soon as he walked inside, saw these openings and believed one of them would be the perfect hiding place. And so he lowered himself feet first into one of these hollow chutes. He got his feet and his legs, his hips, and most of his torso into this tight 9 inch by 17 inch space, but his shoulders were too broad. They would not fit into the pillar. And so he raised one arm over his head and he kept his other arm pinned by his side in order to make himself as narrow as possible. And this worked. Inch by inch, he began sliding deeper and deeper into this two-story tall pillar until he was completely out of sight. But as soon as his shoulders had gone down into that pillar, he would have realized he had made a grave mistake. With one arm pinned above his head and the other pinned by his side, he would not have been able to pull him himself back up out of this narrow space. He was stuck. And so he probably began squirming and trying to use his feet to try to get back up into the attic space. But all of that movement only made him slip farther and farther down into this pillar until his feet touched the ground at the absolute bottom. And so not only is he already in this totally compromised position that would have made it hard to breathe, he was also in such a narrow space that the walls of this pillar literally were crushing his chest, making it nearly impossible to get a full breath of air. And when he screamed out for help, nobody would have heard him because he was entombed inside of multiple layers of cement and brick. Also, making an already horrible situation that much worse, Lancaster, California was experiencing a very significant heat wave that month. And so all day long, the sun would have been blazing down on the outside of that pillar, heating up the inside like an oven. Five days after Ray got trapped, the plumber removed that brick on the pillar, and he and the store manager bent down and looked, and they saw Ray's leg. The smelly 
brown liquid that had been coming out of the pillar that had alerted everyone to this in the first place was purge fluid, which is something that comes out of a decomposing body. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's eye drops with acid. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username is the same on both platforms. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.